strange wills. Starring Warren William and featuring Lorene Tuttle and Carlton Young with Howard Culver and an all-star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. Dead men's wills are often strange. We cannot attempt to understand them or try to find the answers. We can but tell the story. This is Warren William bringing you the story they met in Monte Carlo. But first, a word from your announcer. Here is our distinguished actor of stage, radio, and screen, Warren William, as John Francis O'Connell. If you're looking for adventure, intrigue, or a, a romantic interlude, I can suggest just the place. Monte Carlo. The world-famous gambling casino, in particular, is the rendezvous of many strange characters you expect to find in fiction rather than in real life. I shall never forget the year 1935 and the casino. It was in the roulette room of the casino that I saw the inception of a story as strange, as weird, and as interesting as any it has ever been my pleasure to relate. It all began on a June night. I was sitting at the roulette table, watching the ivory ball of chance spin merrily on its way. Suddenly, I felt a tug at my sleeve. I looked up. A handsome young man was looking down into my face. I beg your pardon, sir, but are you an American? Well, yes, I am, but how did you guess? I just took a chance. <laughs> I'll cash in my remaining plaques and join you. You know, it's nice seeing an American, even in Monte Carlo. <laughs> Dick Marlowe and I introduced ourselves and then took off for the casino bar. Now, I'll tell you why I asked you here for a drink, Mr. Oh, O'Connell. Well, Dick, now that we're friends and compatriots, let's drop the formalities. My name's John. All right, John. <laughs> now then, peer through the gilded and ornate shadows of this delightful room and tell me who you see sitting over there at that table, over there at the far side of the room. Over the far side of the room, eh? Let's see. Oh, yes. Well, Dick, I see a rather pompous gentleman. He's sporting a monocle. There's a lot of class, dark pencil moustache, Sleek hair, rather gray at the temples. Well, hang that old monocle walrus. Take a look at what's sitting with him. Oh, I see. Oh, that is different, isn't it? Good heavens, she's exquisite. Blonde hair and a lavender evening gown. My favorite color. They're mine, too. No, <laughs> excuse me. As long as she's wearing them. <laughs> Listen, John, you're a lawyer. You run into a lot of unusual situations. Now dig down into your law books and tell me how I can meet her. Is that why... Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho! Now I'm beginning to see the light. Look, John, I've got to meet that girl. If there ever was a case of love at first sight, this is it. The more I tried to find out about this love at first sight girl, the less I really learned. Dick came over to my hotel the next afternoon, and I gave him a resume of my efforts. Here, Dick. A drink. Thanks. Now, sit down and relax, young fellow, and I'll spill the beans. Oh, thanks, John. Well, here's to Broadway. And here's to love at first sight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying to meet her is about as easy as crashing in on Princess Elizabeth. Well, here's the dope. 
She lives with her father at the Villa Carlotta. Uh-oh, that means class and plenty of shackles, John. That's the ritziest place in town. Right. And here's some more news. According to the registry, their name is Lux. Mr. Ferdinand Lux and daughter, Carla. Residence, Budapest. Carla Lux, huh? Carla. Hey, that sounds swell to me. Uh, Carla Marlowe. Not bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, here comes disillusionment number one. Lux isn't her real name. It's an alias. An alias? I, I don't... Dick, I learned this morning that Monte Carlo is filling up with people from all over Europe. A lot of political bigwigs are gathering. Uh, so that's it. Political intrigue in the making. Quite huh? obviously. Tonight, Mr. Lux and daughter Carla are attending a dinner party at the home of Monsieur Etienne Dupre, a sort of renegade Frenchman. That would be an excellent opportunity for you and Carla Oh, to, I couldn't uh, break into that dinner day, John. That's for society. Me, I, I'm just a poor guy over here writing an operetta. Oh, but you told me you play the piano, didn't you? Of course I did, but how does that fit? Well, Dick, tonight you're going to entertain the guests of Monsieur Dupre. You see, I hired out your services to Monsieur Dupre this afternoon. The fee is a thousand francs. Not bad pay for an evening's work. I told them over the phone I was a theatrical agent. Oh, no. <laughs> Holy <laughs> Pete, you mean, you mean that I'm going to... Exactly. You will entertain the dinner guests and play in the salon while late coffee is being served. But how will I meet Carla? How can I possibly... You forget, Dick. That music is the great leveler. Give it to her, right from the heart. You play beautifully, monsieur. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm... I'm glad you think so. May I sit down? Oh, I'm highly honored. May I introduce myself? I'm Richard Marlowe, American. How do you do? I am I'm Miss Lux, Carla Lux. Yeah, I know. Now, now that we've dispensed with the formalities, is there something else I could play for you? Oh, there are so many American songs that I would like to hear. I'll play one I just finished writing. It's uh, called Purple Serenade. It's for my new operetta. It has a lovely name. But uh, don't you sing? No, but uh, hear the words. Suppose you read them with me, huh? Me? Sure. Oh, all right. <laughs> Tonight, I'll sing my serenade While evening's purple shadows fade And lovers find their rendezvous in dreams Oh, that's beautiful, beautiful. It never sounded as well. The nightingale keeps on calling Two young hearts in love. Come share with me your fantasy of schemes. I hear a gypsy fiddle playing, a melody of love divine. It tells me once again that you are mine. Yes, well. <laughs> Where is the one for whom this lonely heart was made? One to share my purple salad. Oh. Like it? You're a genius. Really, I mean it. Oh, I wouldn't go that far, but I'm glad you... Won't you, you play some oh. more, please? Oh, we'll have a lot of time for that. Years and years. Years and years? Sure. I, I do not understand. Well, you see, it's this way. You, you see, in America, when the right boy meets the right girl, they get a funny feeling up here, uh, around the heart. But what does that Well, they, do they call that love at first sight. I still do not understand. Yesterday, I saw you in the bar at the casino. Yet, I saw you, too. And you know, Carla, right away, I got that funny feeling around my heart. Just like that. Isn't that strange? Oh, not at all, not at all. Then I decided to meet you. But how did you arrange Well, a very you? good friend of mine hired me out to play for the guests uh -huh. tonight. Aha! Now I'm beginning to understand. <laughs> and so I took the job because I wanted very much to have a little talk with you. Oh, you Americans. You don't let... Oh, what do they say in America? You don't let the dust settle under the foot. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it exactly. <laughs> now, then, while the rest of the party is so deeply engrossed in conversation, how about you showing me the moonrise over Monte Carlo? I've heard it's very beautiful. Oh, I would like some fresh air, too, but be careful. They must not see us leave. Oh, you lead the way. I'll be as quiet as a mouse. I love Follow me. Follow you, honey. I'm way ahead of you. What did you say? Oh, skip it. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> Wait a minute. Allow me. Ah, boy. Look. Just look up there. 
There's our moon. Isn't it lovely? Hmm. Mm, there's a rose arbor. Just get a whiff of those roses. Divine. Oh, boy. This place was made for sweet romance. Tell me, may I call you Dick? Well, Carl, if you don't, I'd consider my progress nil. <laughs> oh, silly boy. <laughs> All right, then, Dick. Tell me, what do you do? Well, I came over here to finish my operetta. You see, Carl, I'm a composer. A composer? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And your operetta, what is it about? Oh, the same old thing. Boy meets girl, boy sings to girl. Carla? Oh. Carla, where are you? Here I am, Monsieur Dupre. I came out here for a breath of air. Uh, well, come right in. Your father wishes to be with you. Yes, monsieur. Oh, stay out here just for a moment until I have a chance to get back. And, Dick. Yes, Carla, what is it? Girl wishes oh so much that she could see boy again. Boy will arrange. <laughs> I come in. Oh, well, good morning. What a mood you're in. Oh, John, am I happy? And do I rate? Do you know Carla and I? Carla? You don't mean to say that you call her by her first name? Well, sure, she asked me to after I got through playing for her. Say, oh, listen, I'm in the clover. Well, tell me about it. Well, she came over to the piano after dinner and sat down with me on the bench. Then she asked me all about myself, and I played for her, and... Later, we went out in the garden, moonlight and roses and all that sort of stuff. Mm, she confided in you? Well, not exactly. Oh. <laughs> in fact, now that I think of it, I don't know any more about her than I ever did. Well, at least you have a speaking acquaintance. From now on, you've simply got to deliver the mail. <laughs> oh, excuse me, John. Every note for Monsieur Marlowe. Oh, thank you. Uh, here you are. Merci, monsieur. Hey, this envelope smells awful good. Hmm, it's enticing. How do you believe I rate, John? Getting a note less than 12 hours since we met. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'll open it. Let's see. Monsieur, please forget last night. I'm not in a position to see you again. My fiancé arrived in Monte Carlo this morning. There can be no more purple serenades. Adieu, Carla. <laughs> Thy name is Persistency. At least it was in our case. Dick and I didn't intend to let any fiancé stand in our way, especially when it concerned Carla. But anything can happen in Monte Carlo, and almost anything did. Yes? Monsieur Colonel? Yes, sir? Uh, good. This is Etienne Dupre. Yes, Monsieur Dupre. Monsieur Colonel, I'm very glad to hear that you are vacationing in Monte Carlo. We need the services of an American lawyer in connection with a will, hmm. a, a very unusual will. I uh, wonder, monsieur, would you please drive over to my home? Why, yes, if it's urgent, I'd be glad to. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just take a taxi in front of your hotel and tell the driver to take you to my home. They all know where I live. Very well, monsieur. I'll leave immediately. <laughs> Part two of They Met in Monte Carlo in just a moment. But first, here is a word from your announcer.
part two of They Met in Monte Carlo with Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. When I arrived at the Dupre home, Monsieur Dupre ushered me into the library. Welcome, Monsieur O'Connell. Welcome to the house of Dupre. Thank you, sir. I want you to meet my colleagues, Herr Eideldorf and Baron X, a special ambassador from the German Reich. How do you do, gentlemen? Uh, the, uh... Now, please do be seated, Monsieur Colonel, and we will, as you say in America, get down to the business. Mm, thank you, Monsieur. Monsieur Colonel, we have learned through secret sources that you supplied the entertainment for our dinner party last night. Supplied the entertainment? Oh, you mean, yeah, the young composer Richard Marlowe. We now understand that he is not uh, exclusively a composer, monsieur. Dick, not a composer? Why, I'm afraid I don't We believe you. that you deliberately sent this man to us as a spy of, uh, of your government. Now, uh, what have you to say? The accusation is unfounded. He came here purely in the interests of... Well, he wanted to meet a certain young lady. Yes, we know. Carla Eideldorf. Carla Eideldorf? The daughter of Herr Eideldorf? Exactly, monsieur. And this gentleman, Baron X, is your fiancé. Monsieur O'Connell, we understand that you are a collector of strange and unusual wills. Oh, that's correct, gentlemen. It has been a sort of avocation. Well, Monsieur O'Connell, the time has come for us to put our cards on the table. What do you mean, Baron? Only this, that hereafter you are to stop your unwanted interference in our affairs. And furthermore, Monsieur, we want to warn you most solemnly that if you persist in sending your spies and confederates to us under the guise of strolling musicians, then... Then what, monsieur? You will be able to add a new will to your collection. Only this will, monsieur O'Connell, will be your own. And you won't be alive to do much about it. Do I make myself clear, monsieur O'Connell? I gather you are threatening me, gentlemen. Your inference is very accurate, monsieur. We do not threaten, monsieur O'Connell. We but warn you. After that... We will not hesitate to do what we consider as a safeguard to our political interests. And now, monsieur, you may go. But remember, if you value your life and that of your compatriot, keep him away from Mademoiselle Eideldorf. That gentleman I consider to be his own personal affair. And I feel quite certain that Mr. Marlowe can take care of his own business affairs quite adequately. Good day, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> well, things were getting exciting. I decided to stop off at Dick's apartment and advise him of what had taken place. Come in. Hi there, you spy. Oh, John. I just met, guess who? Uh, Carla? No, but someone who was rather close to her. Her father, Monsieur Lux. And her fiancé, a very mysterious German who was hiding under the name of Baron X. Fiancé, I, I, I can't believe it, John. Dick, I was invited up to the Etienne Dupre home tonight under the pretext that I was to draw up or examine an unusual will. Examine a will? Of course, the whole thing was a put-up job to get me there. When I arrived, I met as pleasant a gang of cutthroats as I would expect to meet in Sing Sing. John, I don't understand. That's because the night you played for them, you only had eyes for Carla. Dick, remember something for me. I'll try. On the night you attended the reception at the Dupre home, what language was spoken? Well, I heard only conversational French. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. When the men went into the salon for coffee, that's when Carla sat with me at the piano. Yeah, yeah, I remember now. I, I, I heard one of them talking about a, oh, something about a, yeah, I, I remember, about a, a new confederation of European states or something like that, with Berlin as the hub. He, he talked in German. That was just what I suspected. There's a movement on foot to reshape Europe, and the key men are right here in wait, Monte Carlo. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Let me open the door. Maybe some more of the gangsters came back to finish me off. Uh, Carla. Let me in. Let me in. Sure. I'm afraid I was followed. <laughs> Carla, I want you to meet my good friend and compatriot, John Francis O'Connell, an American lawyer. I'm very happy to meet you, sir. And I'm most happy to meet you, mademoiselle. Carla, what in heaven's name brings you here at this hour? Oh, Dick, I'm so frightened for you. Ever since... Ever since the night you played for me, my father, Mr. Dupre, and my fiancé, the Baron, all of them think you came to spy on them. Oh, please leave Monte Carlo at once, today. But I can't understand what this is all about, Carla. What's so secretive? What's cooking over there in the house on the mountaintop? Intrigue, intrigue. Many European powers are gathered to form a new confederation. 
one that will eliminate England and the United States from Europe. And behind it all are, are the Germans. My father is even willing to sacrifice me, to give me to that horrible baron, just to achieve his end. <laughs> oh, Dick, I do not know what to do. What to do? I'll tell you what you're going to do. Listen, Carla, I'm a day ahead of schedule, but here it goes. Carla, I want to marry you. You... Uh, keep you those beautiful lips closed for a moment and let me explain. You see, Carla, I'd intended to ask you tomorrow, but this morning is just as good. I want you to fly to Paris with John and me. We'll live there for a few more weeks. Fly to Paris. Until I finish oh. my musical score. And then we're off to the States. America? America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. And no German barons hiding under the beds. But how? Even though my heart says yes, how possibly could we leave? That's one of the reasons I became a lawyer, Car Carla. I know how to expedite things, how to cut this infernal red tape. Shall I arrange it? Oh, could you, monsieur? Could you? I guarantee that I'll have a plane ready to fly us all to Paris by 7 o'clock tonight. And then, Carl, after we arrive, it won't be too late to, well, sort of make a hurried trip to the marriage bureau. We can still get married tonight, can't we, John? I think I can arrange it. You see, <laughs> darling, how, how invaluable it is to have a lawyer for a friend. Yes, I see, I see. And tomorrow we can start on our honeymoon to the Pyrenees. Think of it. You and I. Oh, Carla, what a honeymoon we'll have. Dick? Yes, darling? Would Monsieur O'Connell arrange that, too? I pulled all the strings that were necessary for our quick exit. Things were moving at such a rapid pace that I could hardly keep abreast of them. Last night, Dick met the lovely and beautiful Carla. Tonight, he was eloping to Paris. Well, that was in the best American tradition. And quite frankly, I didn't blame him. Just after I finished calling the airport, Dick came in. Everything all set, John? It looks as though one eloping couple would escape the clutches of an irate father-in-law. <laughs> and you're not kidding. <laughs> They'd tear us limb from limb if they had any inkling of what we intended to do. Uh, what arrangements did you make with Carla? She's coming here to your apartment by six. She's gone home to allay suspicion and steal as many of her clothes as she can carry out. <laughs> well, at any rate... That'll help some for your budget. Lawyers and budgets. Lawyers and budgets. What's a budget where the beautiful and glamorous Carla is concerned? I wouldn't mind too much about it either, Dick. Now listen, young man, it's getting late. Suppose you go to your rooms, pack up and come back. Then as soon as Carla comes, we'll take a cab to the airport. Meanwhile, I'll file your intention to marry. You know, if you ever sent me a bill for everything you've done for me, John... <laughs> I... I seem to get a sinister pleasure out of outsmarting this mysterious German Baron X, alias Frederick. He's got a lesson coming to him, and a bitter one. Listen, Dick, I'll take care of the luggage. You take Carla and get aboard the plane, and be careful. You never know what the mysterious Baron X and his gang might do if they get wind of what we're up to. I'd like to see him start something. Dick, darling, do as Mr. O'Connell says. I know it is dangerous. Okay, darling, come on. Here we are, monsieur. Bon voyage. Thank you. Uh, John, over there, that's our plane. We'll run for it and meet you there. I won't be long. Let's run, darling. Come along. <laughs> ah, here we are. I'll open the door. Ah, in you go, darling. Thank you. Ah. Welcome, Carla. Oh. And you too, Monsieur Marlowe. Step no. in, please. Wait. Keep your arms up, Monsieur, if you value your life. As you see, I'm armed. And at the moment, in the mood to kill. Frederick, how you... You forget, my dear, that it is possible to listen into phone conversations. We heard you charter a plane for Paris. I hurried over here to stop you, Carl. Your father and Monsieur de Pre are getting out warrants for the arrest of the two Americans for kidnapping. The police will be here momentarily. But I am not being kidnapped, Frederick. I'm going to marry Richard Marlowe. I have decided... What you decide is of little consequence. You will be told whom you shall marry. I shall refuse. To refuse would mean the end of the new European Confederacy, my dear. I pledge Germany's acceptance, but only on the condition that I should have you as my baroness. Look, Baron X, or whatever your name is, you must take the Americans to be a lot of dopes. Who could think otherwise? But as it turns out, you're really the dope. Do you think we'd be stupid enough to anticipate your action? Look behind you, you'll see a man. If you look carefully, you'll see a gun. Ryan, I do not believe you. You oh. fell for the oldest gag in the world. That sock in the jaws with my fondest regards. Monsieur O'Connor. Everything's set. Uh, what's the trouble in there? Look out below, John, while I toss this piece of carrion out the door. Here comes Baron X. The pilot. We have no pilot. Well, we can't wait for him now. Anyway, I hold a private license. Let me get this crate started. 
luckily the engine's warm. Lock that door. Okay. We made it. We made it. Three months later, at 16 Rue Avalon in Paris. How was the operetta, darling? Almost through? I'll have it finished soon, dear. And then the plane to the good old USA. Oh, Dick, I'm so thrilled. Remember what I told you that night out in the garden, Carla? Oh, yes, every word. You said girl better come to America where she can marry anyone she wishes. And then I said girl would like to. <laughs> How long have we been married, darling? Three months. <laughs> Isn't that baby cute? Adorable. When's her mother coming back? In just a few minutes. She just went down to the corner to post a letter. Oh. Warren William will be back to tell you the rest of the story they met in Monte Carlo in just a moment. But first, here is a brief word from your announcer. Here again is Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. Well, Dick and Carla really did find happiness. They came to America the following year, and Dick's operetta proved to be a first-class sensation on Broadway. And if his songs are inspirational, which they are, blame it all on a certain beautiful and alluring blonde who decided that marrying for love is a lot nicer than marrying according to the dictates of a stern parent. And I agree, don't you? Next week I have a story to tell you about blood red rubies and murder. The story begins back in the days of Kubla Khan and his invasion of High Tibet. His soldiers looted the High Temple, cut out the eyes of the pagan goddess and escaped with the two most precious rubies known to be in existence. But a curse went with these rubies, the curse of sudden death. Finally, they came into the possession of a wealthy, retired American business executive. He decided to end the curse and return the jewels to the temple in High Tibet. But before he could do so, death struck, quickly, savagely. We call this unusual story... The girl in cell 13. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crapine and directed by Robert Webster Light. Names, places, and time have all been changed so that no reflection may fall on any person or persons, living or dead. This is a Teloways feature produced in Hollywood. Hollywood.